Hey, all. Thanks for being a part of the Engaging the Bible in Healthy Ways as Adults series. This is session five, our final session. The theme for this one is Engaging the Bible for Personal Growth and Personal Benefit and Inspiration. Now, I raised the question at the start of the presentation, is that something the Bible can actually be useful for? I think it's a standing question. You'll hear it in the presentation. But I do make seven suggestions for ways that we can engage the Bible. And these are going to sound very interpersonal, and they are. I actually borrow them from my own a way of understanding how a person can engage with another person in healthy ways. So I take a relational approach to the Bible. I, I hope you'll find it helpful for your thoughts on the Bible and how you think about that text, but also how we engage with one another and how you engage with another person. That leads me to the discussion portion, which will come in a separate podcast and really worth listening to. It's 45 minutes long and engages the people who are present for this presentation in a conversation. It's really good. The ideas here in this presentation are taken a bit further because of the dialogue nature. So I hope you listen to that. It's really worth it. The people that have been part of this podcast and these sessions are just fantastic thinkers and contributors in their own right. So hope you'll take a minute to listen to that as well. And if you're already a Patreon subscriber, really appreciate it. You're making all this possible. Thank you. And if you'd like to be someone who makes this kind of podcast available and all the other podcasts that I do and receive three weekly commentaries from me on social issues, the Bible, and leadership, as well as an advanced copy of my newest book, Greater Than, How Ordinary People Are Outdoing Jesus and Why It's Good News. Go over to patreon.com and um, become a subscriber. You can find that at dougpaget.com and click on the link. And $13 a month, you help make all this possible, which means a ton to me, but it also means that I can send you some freebies and you'll get a bunch. So, hey, enjoy engaging the Bible in healthy ways as adults, personal growth and inspiration edition. So this fifth session, uh, what I'd like to do is talk about engaging the Bible in healthy ways as adults, using the Bible as personal inspiration and for personal growth. The, the one, the, there's a part of using the Bible that is not um, the historical or the situational or the, um, or the, the, the style of literature None of that stuff at all. There's an awful lot of people who use the Bible and want to talk about the Bible and engage with the Bible as a one of the the sources in their life that helps them to grow personally and for personal inspiration. Right? Uh, I think it's a worthwhile question to ask. Can it be one of those? I I, I, so I'll just say at the beginning. I think that should remain an open question. Right? So everything I'm about to say about this. Can it be one of those, or can there be one of those? Oh, that's even better. Can yeah, there right. be one of those? Yeah. What's, the, what's the difference? What, what, what do you hear is the difference? Because people use the Book of Mormon or the Quran or yeah. Aristotle or, or something like Cicero. Dr. Or, Phil wrote. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. For person, yeah. So I use a lot of things in my life for personal inspiration and for growth. Uh, quotes from movies, storylines from books, uh, all of the scratchy utterances from the pen of Bruce Springsteen, any of those are all, I, I, I grab them and use them as I wish. I do whatever I want with them. I feel no compulsion to the author of a, of a, of a book, to the producer of a movie to stay consistent with what they thought at all. Like it's mine. I watch that movie. The point's now mine. And I just use it however I want in my own narrative or sharing it with others. Um, curiously, I think we have to ask the question, should the Bible ever be used that way? And I think you're asking even a better question, which is, can anything actually function that way? Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to the Bible, I th- so I'm going to suggest tonight, the things I'm going to say for the next 15 or 20 minutes are, here's some ways that I think one could engage the Bible if they want to tr- attempt to use it as personal inspiration or for personal growth. Not entirely sure that we should or not. I think that's really an open question. Um, Uh, Like, if we were to use it as something like um, an artifact of a church community or an artifact in broad-based culture for how someone ought to live, that feels consistent with the rationale and the reason why the texts were written in the first place. 
the Jewish Hebrew communities put together uh, the, the, the First Testament in a way to be a part of the artifact of their community. The early church gathered up writings from apostles and, and others and gospels and put them together as a service toward the formation of a community. If we're going to use them in, those fa- in that fashion, I think that's pretty clear. That's sort of how it was designed. That's what it's meant for. This idea of using it for your own personal benefit, for your own personal growth, or for kind of guiding your own pathway through life, I'm not entirely sure. So to, to reframe or to uh, do a, 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 a version of week one, the Bible wasn't written for that purpose. The Bible has its own purpose of why it was, uh, why the texts were written and then why the collection was put together the way that it was, to try to do something in particular. And giving you inspiration to get up every day and go tackle the world wasn't probably um, the the the, the thinking that, that was going on with it. And I don't think we need a Bible for our own personal faith. I don't think the Christian faith demands it. Like I said in the first week, I think the Christian faith would have done just fine without there ever being a canonized set of scriptures and utilized in a whole other set of ways. But well, that's not our condition. We do have one. So if you were to engage with it as an act of personal inspiration or for personal growth, I have seven thoughts around this. And here's, here's the theory on this. They, and I wrote them down, too, just so you don't think I'm totally bluffing. I bluff a lot. They, um, it's an approach by which I think a healthy adult can engage with another person in their life in a healthy way. There's almost going to be no difference between the way I would talk about this and the way I would also suggest a healthy pattern for an adult to engage with another person. So I'm suggesting a relational approach to the Bible as an adult. What is your relationship with it like? And, and it's rooted mostly in interpersonal relationship rather than in any other, any other form. The other weeks, I think we've taken lots of other uh, sets of relationships. So um, that's, that's an important, uh, I think, structure to all of this. If one's going to use it in some sort of personally powerful way, then I think the way to do that is as a relational approach. And one of those approaches is to allow the Bible to be free to be what it is. To sort of take it, take it as it is, not as we want it to be. Now, that's a really hard thing because we all know the saying, which is just true as, they, as any truism. You don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are. So you're projecting. Everyone is a, a screen and a reality at the same time, right? So you're projecting yourself onto everyone at any given point about who you assume them to be, what you want them to be. But if we could allow the Bible to be what it is and not have to be anything more or anything less. This gets really hard though. It's hard for a lot of us because on both sides of that, more than it is and less than it is, it's really easy to go to either of those. Many of us sitting in this circle and other people who might listen to this, they will feel like the Bible has underperformed its promise in my life time and time again. It is a promise breaker. And other people feel like... Um, uh, that that they that their experience with the Bible has not been so good, and it really deserves to be way better than it is. And they work really hard and study ancient languages and talk to professionals and engage themselves into a set of practices of memorization or of repeating or of of um, of embodying in some way that the Bible can finally be more than what their experience with it is. So by suggesting that we should engage with the Bible and allow it to be free for what it is, that's both whatever it is in some sort of technical sense, right? A collection of 66 books gathered over time in two different communities of faith and argued about over the centuries, or that, or whatever it is to you. So part of, like, like a good therapist would say to you, if you were talking to them about uh, an important person in your life or a family member and you have a conflicted relationship, they would say, hey, let's start with your relationship with your mom or your brother or your uncle or your, uh, uh, your, your lover. Let, let's start with that relationship as it currently is. Like, let's not, let's not, let's see what we can do to get rid of the, what you hope it will be, what you're afraid it won't be, how it's disappointed you. Let's just take it as it is. 
and start there. So part of the act of engaging with the Bible in a relational way, allowing it to be as it is, is both in any technical terms we find out about it. So I think the, the rule of if it's true, you shouldn't be afraid of it. This is what Tom Olson around here uh, uh, has taught me. And he's, um, he does this work with people who are um, dealing with addictions and their addictions have led them to criminal behavior. And he said, one of the pieces of work he does with people in these situations is, is to help them grasp the idea that the truth is your friend and you don't need to be afraid of it. Take it as it is. Now, now that doesn't mean it doesn't have great impact on your life. It doesn't mean it doesn't totally and completely demolish you. But you don't have to be afraid of even that. If it's true, you don't need to be afraid of it. And then we should all pull out our inner Pontius Pilate and say, what is truth? I wash my hands. I wash my hands of this whole thing. But uh, if, if you don't do it. So allowing the Bible to be whatever it is as you run into that. And then whatever it is for you. And that's probably the most important part of any healthy engagement with the Bible, if you're going to use it in a personal way, is to do an inventory and say, really, what do I think of this thing? Where am I with this? Um, a lot of us feel like an estranged lover much more than we feel like um, uh, and we're having an analytical relationship with the Bible. Like we, the, When we think about it, we still get a little angsty because that angst means there's still some feeling there. Right? You, you know the, old, the, the, the saying that the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is indifference? That you know that you no longer feel that way for someone when you can just it doesn't affect you in the same way anymore. That if you still have something stirred up in you, even if it's anger, there's something going on there. Um, so doing a little personal inventory of yourself around the Bible um, is, is a really important part of engaging. Okay, so point two, and we can talk about all these at the end. And I have them listed, so this time we can come back. Um, the second way to encounter the Bible in a healthy way uh, for personal and interpersonal life and growth is to engage with the Bible in a way that every encounter with it doesn't have to matter and be so great. That, that, that if you read the Bible, if you engage with it, if you hear someone talk about it or quote it, and you're kind of like, eh, not really much there, don't really care, that's okay. That's just the Bible being itself. Just like any person you're with, you might spend a day with someone, and someone says, well, how, you were with your sister today, how was it? And you're like, nah, you know, that's fine. That was just it, like nothing real, nothing, no biggie there. And sometimes it's super special, and, but not every time has to be something that to think about or to engage or to read something in the Bible and think, that has literally nothing to do with my life. Why would I? Well, yeah, that's kind of true. As it would be in any relationship, sometimes another, per, to, to do some anthropomorphism, another person's life might not have anything to do with you. And you're honestly just listening because that's what's important to them. And just like, kind of got nothing to do with me. I, that's great for you. So there's, I don't know what percentage. I would be willing to say 60, 80% of the Bible. It's, but just like any person, 60, 80% of another person's life, not really your thing, kind of their thing. Like it's only your thing because you care about them. If they were a stranger and told you all the things that happened, you'd be like, not really my thing. And so to bring up the Bible or to, to bring ourselves into a, a, a set of um, practices with the Bible where we can say, you know, once a year I got something great out of it. That's pretty good. I think that's, that's pretty great. I, I've often said, I don't say it so much around here at Solomon's Porch, but I say to other uh, people that go to other churches, like if I travel somewhere and speak at a church or if I'm in other spaces, I'll say, you know, if you get two great sermons a year at your church, you should count yourself lucky. Most people only get one. <laughs> like that's pretty good. One a year, that's great. 15 a year that are, nah, that was worth listening to. And I don't know, like 30 that were, it's probably good for somebody. That's pretty, that's still pretty great. Like that's, that's good enough. So I think, honestly, lowering our expectations into every encounter with the Bible would be a great thing. Number three, um, it's really important that one can argue with the Bible, push back on it, say to yourself, no, I would never, that, I would never be like that. There's characters in the Bible, there's storylines in the Bible to just say like, oh, that is, I, no, I, that is not my thing at all. And to allow it to have its own opinion 
and to know that you have something to gain from it yourself. So like you would with a person, to be able to say, no, I, that's not how I see the world at all. But you have your own opinion about that, and maybe there's something of value in that opinion that you hold that I totally disagree with, but is there something of value in there for me? Because if we don't have the, just my experience with the Bible, if you don't have the ability and the, the freedom, internal freedom in, your, in yourself to say, no, why would it even do that? Why would it talk like that? Why would it say that? I wonder if there's something in there that my own bias doesn't allow, like, like what is that that's going on? Um, if you don't have the freedom to do that, it's just irritating as all get out. It's just, um, it's too often that you'll run into things if you take the Bible seriously or spend any time with it at all where you're like, what? No, it's a, it's a highly opinionated and highly differentiated text from all of our lives. Uh, so the ability to push back, argue back, but then say, there's some reason, I wonder what that is. That's a really healthy, healthy kind of practice. And, you know, not a bad one for a lot of people we know, we, we know in our lives. And so the fourth would sort of be a, a subroot of that, which is getting to know the Bible beyond its, its surface level. So I was sort of joking at the beginning. None of you really know me. I mean, you might think you know me, but like no one knows me like I know me, right? Like there's a secret part of me that I don't. Uh, that's true of all of us. All of us are a stranger to one another. And the only difference between people you know really close and know you really intimately um, and other people is you're keeping less things from the people that are intimate to you. But everyone's keeping stuff. Everybody. That's what makes you, you. Uh, And getting to know the parts of another person that uh, that you didn't know before even someone you've known for a really long time is incredibly eye-opening and is always possible. So there is more to the Bible, there's more to all of this stuff in this text than any of us could ever sort of imagine that we know. And to approach it like that, um, and to, to ask the question of ourselves, why does the Bible think this is important, not what does the Bible think is important. So if you've heard me talk on this stuff before interpersonally, I think the most important question we can ask of another person is why does that matter to you in addition to what matters to you? Because if we only know the what's or we only know the how's and we don't know the why, the person stays elusive. So finding a sense of what's, what's up with you, <laughs> what's... You know, that, the name of that, that, that movie with Johnny Depp, one of those early ones, What's Eating Gilbert Grape? Uh, I think it's a great movie from what I remember. And it's a great title, What's Eating That Guy? So I've held that uh, in, my, in my mind a lot. Um, that phrase like, huh, I wonder what's eating at her right now. There's something, because there's something going on that I don't know. And that's, that's, that makes the Bible interesting. It makes it elusive. It makes it, I don't know, it just makes it like, all right, I'll do these quickly. Uh, no, number five, um, know that you can learn something new from it, even if you're highly familiar with it. So the approach to um, like getting together with, sometimes if you're in deep long-term friendships or family relationships or especially with a partner or something, it can be really easy to assume that you've stopped learning something new from them. You kind of know them, you know them well enough, and then you get into routines and you just fall right into the same pattern. And then in that relationship, someone else finds them really interesting and learns a lot from them. You're like, well, I didn't know that. And it's because sometimes we don't ask the questions of each other. There's a lot of things we don't do about each other, with, with, with each other because we fall into these patterns. Well, anything familiar with us, uh, to, to us in our lives becomes that way. And uh, I, will t- I mean, I had probably 10 years where I thought, honestly, I d- and this sounds so, so pejorative, like, I don't think there's anything important left in the Bible that I haven't really kind of gone around on. Like, uh, uh, this is just killing me. And that was not because the Bible was not interesting. That's because I had ceased to become uninterested in learning anything new from it. It's really true. All right, so n- number six. Allow it to be a pattern for your life and a lesson teacher in its failures as well as its successes. So 
finding a way to engage, if you're going to engage with the Bible like his personal growth, there's more in the Bible about how not to live one's life than how to live one's life. There's enough storylines of, of struggle and people treating each other badly and calling for violence and, and exclusionary activity going on that can be like, why don't I read the Bible and find all the failures that sort of correspond to my own failures in life that I can kind of have a, have a partner with and learn from? Because it's really easy to think that the Bible is, a, is some sort of a set of fables that are, is always going to give you the pattern for how you should live so clearly. And it's a whole lot easier to read some pieces and be like, oh, that, that sounds terrible. It's, it's like, it's like a, one of the Coen brother movies or something, right? It's like Fargo. Like you don't watch the movie Fargo or the two or three episodes, seasons of Fargo, which are fantastic television, the best ever made. You, you, you don't watch those and say, that's how I should be. You watch those to say like, oh my God, what if that's me? What if, how, how am I like that? How am I that, how am I that person? How am I that character? All right, now, number seven, and this will perhaps be the most surprising to some of you and, and, and uninteresting. Um, if, if you want to engage with the Bible in some way that's f- inspirational to you personally and good for your own personal growth, share it and talk about it with other people. Advocate on its behalf to others. Like you would with a friend. When you tell your fr- a new friend about your other friend, like, hey, I've got this friend that I'd really love for you to meet. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. That does a lot to build your relationship totally independent from that person. Or if you've got a partner in your life and someone says, oh, who, who are you partnered with? And you're like, oh, I'm dating or I'm married to this, this person. Oh, tell me about him. And when you start talking about that person, it builds your relationship with them in a different way because now you're their advocate. Now you're their um, their 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 uh, propagandizer, right? You're their, you're their cheerleader. cheerleader. That's a great word. And nothing does something, uh, th- honest, honestly, I'll tell you, uh, tr- truthfully, as somebody who's in the profession of, 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 of Christian religious work and talks to a lot of pastors, many pastors stay in the role of being a pastor because they're pretty sure that's the only way they're going to stay in the faith. If they weren't talking about this stuff in a positive way on a regular basis, they would bank out. They're not in it because they love it so much. So many of us are in it because we don't want to leave it. And it's the only way to stay in. So talking about it and advocating for it and, and kind of being, finding the best of it really does something good to you where you're like, I think there's actually something good. Now, that can tip into like... I think I'm just being dishonest and I'm just not telling the truth anymore. And that, that's when people burn out and they embezzle money from the church or have an affair with their assist, assistant. Do, do one of the three or four things that a pastor can do to pull the trigger, to pull the parachute to get out. And there's a few of them uh, and only a few of them apparently. Like just saying, I'm done, I want to quit. That doesn't seem to be one of them. You have to come up with something else for a lot of people. Um, but, but the idea of advocating on behalf of and sharing it with others is super Super helpful and super important. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll end with that, and if um, uh, and then we'll and then we'll come back here in a minute and uh, have a little have a little response and dialogue. Okay, all right. So let's take a five minute break. And... All right. Well, there it is. Hope you enjoyed. I certainly enjoyed doing it. Now stick around for the discussion over in the next podcast. And thanks again for being a part of engaging the Bible in healthy ways as adults. <laughs>